Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Luminosity of Free Software, episode 10. We missed last week, or rather, I missed last week due to an unfortunate bit of illness I came down with. We went away for the uh, Easter weekend holiday, and I came back and ended up on my back for a few days. So that was that. But we're back again this week with a good show, I hope, anyways. It's a little bit later than usual, at least where I live, because of daylight savings time. I had put uh, on the announcement that it was the usual you know, 8 p.m. UTC. And then I was reminded, oh, yeah, there's daylight savings time. So I thought, OK, great, no problem. I'll just do it at 10 p.m. my time uh, for this week. And then it turns out that Google Plus happily and so kindly adjusted the time for me because I said, no, I'm going to put the time in UTC. And apparently that means uh, I'm putting the time in UTC, but I actually mean my time here. Um, and so it adjusted it for me happily. And so I came on this afternoon to look at my event, and it was for 7 p.m. UTC suddenly today. Hooray. Uh, yes. So but we're all here. And we've got a lineup of three topics. We're back to the long format. I tried in the last episode a shorter format. And you know, it went well, but some people said they would prefer the longer format. So here we go. Uh, the three topics that we'll be taking on this week are a little more about stuff that I work on um, than has been the last nine episodes. I figure that one in 10 is, is fine um, to have a slightly self-indulgent show. Besides, it's later, and so I'm wearing my comfy uh, shirt here, and we'll talk about some hopefully really interesting things, uh, but stuff that I'm working on, um, as well as people that are obviously in our teams. So the first topic, and let me actually open up the Hangout toolbox here, which apparently got an upgrade, and so I had to reconfirm that I do want it installed. And let me throw the topic there. So the first topic we're going to be discussing is the upcoming uh, Plasma Workspaces 2. And this is interesting um, because, well, it's the next major version of the Plasma Workspaces, desktop, active, netbook, etc. And we have a really big meeting coming up next week. I arrive on Tuesday, actually, and we're there until the Monday after that. Um, and we're going to be working on this next major release, this next major iteration of Plasma. And I keep using the word major, uh, although I think for a lot of our desktop users, it won't seem that major because we're not really focusing on a complete rework of the desktop shell. We're fairly happy with where most of it is, but there's a lot of the underlying technology that we're going to be working on. So I grabbed the list and printed it out because I like killing trees, as everyone knows. Um, the list of uh, proposed topics for next week. And we usually do these, these meetings kind of as um, what maybe is commonly or popularly referred to as unconferences, where we come with uh, topics that we have in our heads. We usually put them on a wiki page so that everyone in the team can uh, think about them and come prepared so it's not, you know, you don't get completely blindsided. But then we really figure out the final agenda um, on the first morning after doing kind of a meet and greet for the new people um, and a catch up of this is what we've been doing and what we've been working on uh, not since we last saw each other, which was some months ago at this point. So the topics that have been proposed so far, and I'll just read you some of them here, uh, include the some really boring things, such as the plugin implementation. So Qt5 introduced some new plugin infrastructure, and this is potentially slash probably deprecating the K plugin loader in, in K, KDE libraries. So we have to figure out how to work with this new thing. Um, I actually did some work on this a couple weeks ago and found out or ended up finding out that the Qt, the stuff that's in Qt 5 right now isn't quite featureful enough for us. So we have some work there. Um, the Plasma Quick 2 API, and this is largely about documentation. So we have all of the QML uh, bindings that we've had for quite some time, and we've ported them over one by one to Qt 5. Um, this is already working. Um, and so we're talking now about you know, what 
if anything has changed, uh, documenting it. And it turns out the changes are very minimal, but we also want to talk about how we want to document that API and present it. Uh, a large number of the discussion, however, ends up revolving around uh, window manager, in particular Quinn. And this is for a couple of reasons. One is, well, when we first started working on Plasma Desktop way back, you know, four or five years ago, uh, a lot of the things we were trying to introduce, I knew were already fairly out there and, and pushing some boundaries. And I figured that eventually we get to the point where we would start integrating more tightly with the window manager and we'd start you know, integrating more tightly with applications, but this would take time. The ideas of activities I figured would take time to catch on, sure enough. We knew that technologies like Nepomuk would take a, a while to mature. Um, and you know, trying to convince everybody that, oh, jump and pile on this technology that's completely, you know, at the very beginning, just in my head, is a little difficult. And when it's not, you know, mature yet, it's really hard to convince uh, developers who can often be, you know, and to their credit, fairly conservative uh, in adopting new things. So well, that was then. And it was at the second uh, Plasma meeting, which we, by the way, call Tokamax. Um, for the physics geeks out there, you'll know that a Tokamak is a kind of uh, particle accelerator that, um, or sorry, it's a, uh, not a particle accelerator. It is a containment, um, that's a container uh, for holding hot plasma in a magnetic a toroid shape, essentially. And it uses magnets to do this. Um, so I thought the whole idea of having a, you know, some physical object that contains a bunch of plasma would be a great name for our meetings. Um, so talking back to, we invited uh, the Quinn, I think it was talking back to, uh, the Quinn maintainer or developer, main developer at the time, who is the maintainer now, Martin Graislin. And he came and we kind of poked around some things that could be done. Um, these days, we work really as one big team. We have our individual things that we're all responsible for, but we work very tightly together. So, I mean, there's just a huge number of, of things to do with Quinn. How are we going to do inter-process communication? What kind of dependencies uh, will we have on Quinn, especially when we move from X11 to Wayland? Uh, how do we want to integrate activities with, with Quinn better? Um, how do we do plasma add-ons for, for Quinn? Theming in Quinn? Uh, window decorations for things like Plasma Active? Can we, you know, how can that happen in a touch-friendly way? Um, do we want to have them? Um, full screen applications, this is a window management issue, um, particularly on touch. Um, so there's a number of things, and, and some of them are, are one-liners like Plasma Quinn, IPC, inter-process communication. And that was actually quite big, because right now we don't talk much dbus between Quinn and the desktop shell. Mostly what we do is we talk via X, or X11. So we set atoms, X atoms on Windows. And we say, okay, this window is the dashboard window. The, we also do things in Plasma like uh, show these fancy little tooltip things, like when you hover over windows in the in the taskbar, um, and then we move them around. As you move the mouse, then the tooltip kind of zips around and resizes. So a lot of this changes when we move to Wayland. Number one, windows are not allowed to move themselves, um, not in the sense of moving, knowing what their geometry is on screen. This is completely hidden from them. And this is great because it means that windows can no longer screw over the window manager. However, it's also not so great when we have fairly legitimate use cases such as uh, we're showing a tooltip um, that it's not really a tooltip, it's actually a a unmanaged window with no window decorations, and we're populating it with all its rich content, and we'd like to move it around the screen. Um, also, all those X atoms that we're setting these days, uh, that's going to, you know, in a pure Wayland world, that also goes away. So one of the big topics is in the move to Wayland, which we're working on quite a bit these days, what do we do to replace this and what do we use for uh, IPC? And one of the topics or one of the ideas that was floated by Martin that I think is great is the idea that from here on forward, we'll actually use uh, the Wayland protocol, even in an X11 environment. It doesn't mean we'll be running Wayland in the background or that you, you know, we're going to uh, push 
compositing in an X11 environment as a requirement. But we're going to use the protocol, the wire protocol, because a big part of Wayland is this protocol that allows one application to speak to another. And in the Wayland model, the desk or the window manager or whatever is doing the compositing, which tends to be the thing that's also managing the windows, the compositor is privileged. It can know where windows are on screen. Obviously, it has to. It's the window manager. So it can know that. Um, it can move things, windows around as it pleases, which is what we need for things like tooltips. Um, but we need to be able to communicate um, with this privileged process. Uh, Dbus is okay, but it's uh, fairly high latency, um, which is fine for the things it was designed for. But for this, not not tremendously much. Um, it, it also isn't possible to know what's on the other end of a Dbus. Uh, call. It's, it's very much a kind of a trust thing. Um, Dbus doesn't have a lot of built-in security, which again is fine because it's not what it's designed for. Um, whereas with the Wayland protocol and the Wayland approach, this gives us a lot more surety, which we really need, especially on uh, mobile platforms where you tend to have a lot more random third-party stuff running and more sensitive data. People feel a lot more protective about that than even the desktop. But So we're thinking about, well, maybe we just move to the Wayland protocol for all new uh, desktop window management interoperability communication, which is interesting. So we're going to be talking about all of that. Well, where are we right now? And there's a reason why we're doing this meeting now. First, we have uh, Qt 5.1 that's coming out very soon, which will be the first release that we'll be able to uh, do packaged builds of Frameworks 5 because it requires some things that are in Qt 5.1 coming up. And we have the Plasma Frameworks, which is the frameworkized version of LibPlasma and all of its runtime requirements. And this is already in a separate Git repository, Plasma-Framework. And I know we're mad masters of uh, imagination there. And inside of it, we have the LibPlasma 2 with quite a bit of refactoring. It's one of the very few uh, KDE libraries in Frameworks 5 that's seen a large class-by-class uh, -class refactoring. We settled into a um, ABI and API uh, guarantee around, well, quite some years ago now at 4.2. So that was eight releases ago, four years ago almost. And that held up pretty well. We really haven't felt many you know, growing pains, but we've, as time has gone on, we realized there are certain things we could have done a lot uh, differently now that we understand how they're used better. Um, so we've been working on a lot of, of those refactorings. Uh, most of it only affects people that are writing shells, however. And in that same repository is our new shell, which for me is one of the more exciting bits because up until now we've said, well, we're, we're sharing huge amounts of code between desktop and uh, tablets. And when we did the phone um, demo or, or prototype, again, we were reusing huge chunks of code. Uh, netbook, very little difference from desktop in terms of lines of code count. It's mostly configuration and display. Uh, Plasma Media Center, same kind of story. But with the one shell, um, with each of these, right now they have their own little kind of starter um, application. And this starter application that launches the main UI, which is if you do um, a PSAUX from a console or you, you know, bring up your process manager, you'll see Plasma-Desktop as a process. And that's the thing that's doing the panels on the screen. And if you have a Plasma Active uh, installation, if you do the same thing, you'll see Plasma-Device. So these are different binaries, and they range anywhere from a few hundred lines to you know, five or 6,000 lines of code, depending on, on how specialized they are. Uh, with the work on, on Plasma Workspaces 2, those are all going away. and replacing them with one shell. And for those people who are allergic to the idea of a one-size-fits-all UI for tablet and desktop, um, I'm right there with you. I think it's ridiculous that you, you, I mean, you can share huge amounts of code, and the UI can adapt from uh, in, uh, form factor to form factor, use case to use case, but it does need to be, the end result on screen needs to be different in some way. So we'll have the one shell, but the entire workspace gets loaded using uh, and defined really uh, using QML files off disk. It's how we already do it with Plasma Active. With uh, the Plasma device shell, 
it doesn't really define or doesn't define actually the top bar or the activity slider on the side. It doesn't do any of those things. Um, it just loads QML, which sets all of that up. What the shell needs to provide is facility for, I can give you a panel window and then you put whatever you want inside of it. And I can let you put in sliders and draggable you know, bars from the side and I can manage multiple windows or multiple screens, sorry. So when new screens pop up, I can say, hey, we need more, you know, hmm. Um, cowbell, apparently. Uh, no, we need more, you know, another containment or whatever. So, and, you know, handling auto-hide of panels, um, you know, doing uh, the dashboard window on desktop that pops up if you request it. Those things are things that the shell does. And so all of those behind the scenes things, we've, been, we've managed to uh, factor out of the individual binaries for Plasma Desktop, Plasma Netbook, Plasma Active, etc., and make one shell that can load the QML for any of these and then look just like Plasma Active or Plasma Desktop. So it's one more step towards this, you know, goal of ultimate uh, or maximizing the amount of code that's being shared and the development approach. So this is really, really nice for people who are going to be making, uh, if you want to make a different workspace. Previously, and, and right now, what you have to do is write that shell yourself to get started. So you take Live Plasma, and then you write something that throws windows on screen, you know, a desktop layer, or maybe a panel, or whatever else your, you know, magical uh, workspace environment has. And you have to start writing it there. With uh, Plasma Workspaces 2, you just skip all that, you go straight to your QML, and the base shell is actually included in the Plasma Frameworks repository. So if you have the libplasma2 library, you also have all the runtime components along with it necessary to run your, your shell. Um, so this is really nice. It just eliminates a huge amount of code right there. And it also means you don't have to understand some of the concepts that if you're writing the shell from scratch, you do, such as you have a corona, and multiple within that corona, you have multiple containments, and those containments are the layout for the applets. This becomes something you can start to ignore a bit more. So that's all good. Um, some of the topics that I want to visit and that some of the other people want to visit include um, some of the uh, visuals, what do we want to present, how do we want the visual identity to be, to look like. Um, Marco has already worked on, been working on a new activity manager UI, which I really quite like. I've seen a preview of it, um, as well as a revisit of the uh, guts of KRunner um, and how we might be able to do that even a little bit better and improve upon where we are. So we have a huge number of topics to discuss in a week's time. We have one week to do it, um, but I'm really looking forward to it. And given how quickly we've gotten to the shell here, I would not be surprised at all if we see a release within you know, maybe by the beginning of next year, at uh, the latest, I would imagine. Um, yes, and again, this is also a huge part of our movement towards Wayland. Uh, Plasma Workspaces 2, one of our goals there is, uh, or one of our kind of requirements even, is to be able to run it on top of, of Wayland. So I talked quite a bit about, you know, our QML with regards to Plasma Workspaces 2. No surprise, I've been talking about QML for quite a bit. Um, it's kind of our, at least in the Plasma world, our you know almost silver bullet. I don't believe in silver bullets, but if we had one, that would be it these days. So I had a really interesting discussion online this last week with some people about what is QML. And one person brought out the very interesting observation that it's important not to mislead people into thinking that QML is JavaScript. Um, and they point out that they ran into this problem where they work because they were thinking about whether to use HTML5 or QML for this in-house um, tool that they were doing. And either one, it, it wasn't a deployment issue. It was just, you know, which one would work better. And the people making the decision on which tool to use were like, well, but, you know, QML is JavaScript, so, I mean, really, what's the difference? Let's go for the standard uh, version of it, which is, which is HTML5. And uh, he actually, fortunately, got them to actually try QML, work with it, 
see how it goes, and they then walked away with the realization that, oh, it isn't JavaScript per se. So this is a really interesting um, kind of, you know, difficult topic because on the one hand, QML is JavaScript. It runs inside or on top of um, a JavaScript interpreter, sort of. So uh, is it JavaScript? Well, it does take QML and it does end up creating a large number of objects in the JavaScript runtime environment and then runs everything inside of it. So right now it's using V8, uh, well known from WebKit, for instance. For this, it used other uh, JavaScript or ECMAScript really implementations in the past, including um, Qt script at one point. Um, they're looking at replacing it again in the future and it's an internal kind of implementation detail which one they use. But it does use an ECMA script interpreter at some level. But what it, the way I always see it is it's not actually JavaScript. It's an extension to ECMAScript or it's an ECMAScript extension. So it takes ECMAScript and then adds a whole bunch of things on the side of it. It isn't um, like a lot of these, you know, jQuery type things where it's something written in JavaScript that runs on top of the JavaScript interpreter that you then use from your JavaScript or your HTML, um, but it's all kind of living up here at the JavaScript level. It's actually an extension to ECMAScript. It adds syntax, it adds um, file structure, it adds things like imports, uh, which obviously don't exist in the, in the JavaScript world, um, or at least the ECMAScript world on its own. You can add this. A lot of them do this. Um, Node.js, for instance, adds this to ECMAScript as well. Um, but QML adds its whole set of functionality. It also does a huge amount of bridging between C++ objects and the JavaScript runtime. And one of its main tricks is introspection, where it takes typical cute Q object based subclasses in C++, looks at all their properties, which it can enlist and enumerate at runtime, which of course is what introspection is, and look at its methods and all of these, and then bridges that into a JavaScript object. So when you call, you know, if you set the property in the JavaScript object, it's actually calling a setter in the C++ object. And so some of the things that it imports, it is kind of hard-coded and hardwired in and just handwritten, if you will. But the vast majority of bridging it does is taking Q object, Q meta object, I should say, um, and uh, binding that at runtime into the JavaScript environment. And this gives you access to all kinds of things in Qt, which is how you get GL. So WebGL is a addition of you know OpenGL to the HTML5 environment. Um, with Qt, it was fairly straightforward and easy. We take the the string that is the uh, uh, OpenGL uh, program or the the shader program, and we feed it through the OpenGL support that we have in Qt to make all that magical thing happen. Um, where it gets tricky is that there's a scene graph. In behind all this. Now, the scene graph is also pure OpenGL, and it renders everything using GL. The nice thing about the way the scene graph is set up is it allows it to do minimal rendering. It knows what it should render, what it doesn't have to render. Um, it doesn't render from, um, uh, it only renders from back forward uh, if it needs to. It can, it knows enough when it says, okay, I don't have to touch that. Um, I can stop rendering there, or or I can reuse what I've rendered here. And because it does it all in hardware, it's also very quick. And because you can use shaders, you can do magical things with it. And all of that is also written in C++. And, and that also sits kind of aside or adjunct to the JavaScript runtime. So again, the you know QML, not really JavaScript. It uses it as a language internally. Um, but it's a lot more than, than JavaScript. And if you think of it as JavaScript, you're really missing the big picture. You can use, and this is, I think, where it gets difficult for a lot of, or fuzzy for a lot of people, is you can use JavaScript um, uh, expressions when you assign to properties in a QML item. 
which are not JavaScript objects, but they end up looking a lot like JavaScript objects because you can freely mix JavaScript in with them. Of course, QML items have this really magical property binding where if you assign a value to that property and then you change that value somewhere else in the code, it automatically updates the property of the item, which is really the magic of QML. Um, but they end up looking a lot like JavaScript objects, but they aren't. Not really anyways. I mean, eventually they become JavaScript objects, but there's a whole bunch of glue code that happens in there. And a lot of that is in C++. Um, it also, of course, has a parser. And none of the parsing is done in JavaScript. It's all done in C++. So it's fairly performant. Um, it does things like imports as well. And that's where the imports are controlled. And something we're probably going to be talking about at the Plasma Workspaces 2 meeting again next week is, can we do something better with imports in QML. Uh, right now in QML you say import foo.blah.bar and it simply imports if it finds it. It doesn't, there's no way of restricting access to it. Um, so it kind of makes imports not the best of structures for uh, functionality that you need to provide controls over, but we plan on fixing that. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, it runs right now in a standard normal JavaScript um, in, uh, runtime engine, one that's bored from WebKit at the moment, but they're looking at other options as well. And so it's not really tied deeply into a given JavaScript runtime. Um, and, and in that sense, QML is extremely different than, yeah, regular JavaScript. So I, I took the, 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 the person's input and really thought about it and, end up agreeing with him that, yeah, we probably shouldn't call QML JavaScript because although it's very much tied in with that technology, it is very misleading for people who are not familiar with the deep internals of, of QML. So I'm thinking about talking to people more about it as it's an extension to ECMAScript um, rather than um, it is JavaScript. So that brings us to our third topic. Um, and let me, oh, and I just closed the, the Hangout toolbox. There we go, back open again. And this one is a little bit more fun. Um, if you saw Slashdot today, yes, Slashdot, the realm of all sensible comments, um, there was a topic there about um, I'll actually throw the link down in just a moment. Actually, let me go grab that link. I have it at my fingertips here. Ish, at my fingertips. So it's it's down there in the uh, um, in the comment area. Hello. It's not mirroring my video anymore, but it's down there. Um, and I'll put it in the comment or in the in the YouTube dis uh, description later as well as I usually do. And in that um, slash dot article, it was talking about um, this EOMA sixty eight CPU card, which sounds dramatically exciting. I know. I'm just gonna grab a quick drink of the the magic elixir. My throat says thank you. Um, so this EOMA 68 CPU card, um, EOMA, EOMA 68 stands for Embedded Open March Modular Architecture. Um, it's, I mean, yeah, yet another acronym because really that's what we're missing in computing, isn't it? Um, we need more of these things. So the EOMA 68, and I actually have no idea where the 68 came from, whether 67 before it, I don't know. But it defines um, a form factor, so physical size, a packaging system, um, and certain things that it has to guarantee to offer. So um, what's really interesting about it, though, yeah, I mean, there's a million different, you know, here's a hardware specification and then, you know, three companies go off and, and make something of that specification. And it's handy for hardware uh, companies to, you know, specify things um, in detail so that when they work together, they can just refer to these, you know, detailed 
bits of, of text and paper and drawings. Um, and so there's, you know, fewer in, in hopes miscommunication. So the EOMA 68 is, is one of these specifications. What's interesting about it is it's open. Um, I'll actually change the link really quick to the uh, elinux.org um, documentation for it. So um, it has, uh, it, in the specification, it talks about, you know, SATA, I2C, USB, Ethernet, um, RGB, TTL, uh, and uh, most interestingly enough, if you look at the any of the images, you'll see they bear a striking resemblance to a PCMCIA card, if or PC card as they came to be later known, because again, PCMCIA is one of those other acronyms that is really hard to get your mouth around and to remember if you're a normal human being. Uh, and it looks a lot like a PCMCIA card, and that's because it uses the same physical form factor. In fact, when you mate it up with a host board, you actually use those connectors, that same PCMCIA header, um, to connect it. So we have been working really, really, really hard on, uh, and by we, I mean myself and a few other people, um, including the people at, at Rhombus Tech that submitted that article um, to, to Slashdot, uh, QI Mod, who is kind of our one of our really important bridges with Asia. We've been working on developing this this hardware um, for quite some time now, um, and it's all coming together. And we actually have bits of hardware that are falling off the ends of of uh, uh, factory assembly lines. So I have a few images here, and I thought I would share them with you. And describe a little bit about what what we what we're doing with the hardware. Um, so I'm going to screen share this. Once screen share decides to come up, there it is. Great. So let me see if I can actually um, hide this toolbar. been so long since I actually hit or changed any of these toolbars. I have no idea where that is, if you can or not. It's probably under settings, isn't it? No. Ah, uh, well. Oh, uh, no, that's show menu bar. Pff, no idea where it is. I'll forget about it for now. Um, so this is the wonderful schematic of the system on chip card. Well, it's the card that holds the system on chip, and this is the OMA 68. Now, what's really cool about all of this is that everything that we're doing is open. So we're not doing this um, for you know to intend to do it behind closed doors and then keep this design, you know, ultimately to ourselves and you know not show anybody in the world. We believe in open hardware, just as we believe in open software, because we believe in open and free culture in general. So this is the um, uh, the actual uh, schematic of what is coming off the line for this card. As you can see, it's fairly small, 78.1 millimeters by 47.3 millimeters, so just under 5 centimeters by 8 centimeters. Really not the, um, the biggest of things. Um, because it's such a small card, it, it is a little bit difficult to fit everything onto it. Now, what's on here is the C, uh, uh, the CPU or and the GPU and the main memory and the uh, main set of embedded storage. Um, so there's a lot of pieces here. There's also the micro SD right here on the right. I assume you can see my, yes, you can see my, uh, my cursor good. So there's a um, SD card here, and then we have HDMI, and on the top and the bottom we have HDMI and USB. And you can power this whole thing through the USB um, port as well. So that's really quite nice because it means that if you're using this as a development board outside of a product, and um, you don't need a separate you know five volts um, power adapter, you just plug it into something um, you know that has. Uh, USB that's that is powered. 
and away you can go. Um, which is also really neat because you can power it up with your laptop and then also talk to it. So that's kind of cool. The, uh, it does support um, Ethernet um, as well. So, and the Ethernet actually takes a really strange route on here, but it was just because they ran out of space to run traces for everything else that was on here. The uh, memory is up here. There's four ICs of DDR3 RAM um, there. And then the Ethernet, it's actually right up here. Um, and then it goes, yeah, it kind of goes all the way around. As you can see, do, 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 do. Um, and the CPU, the CPU package is right here. Um, yes, so there's all a whole bunch of, whole bunch of components. Um, what does it actually look like in? Oh, that's a 3D rendering of it, which shows again where the, the CPU goes, SD card, um, the other ports over here for USB and HDMI, and then yeah, where this the RAM goes and the storage and yada, yada, yada. And that's what they look like. They've come off, uh, these are five of the units that came off. I think just a few days ago, two, three days ago, off the line. Um, you can see the PCMCA header at the, um, at the back here. And you can see the connectors uh, for USB and HDMI on that side. So they're really low profile, which is really, really cool. And that device is actually powering that television display right there in HD. Um, that image is, if you look, if you peer even somewhat closely, you'll see that it's a, um, a Android image. Um, now the nice thing about this, so when at the hardware, uh, when they're putting the hardware together, they test with um, Android uh, right now anyways. But what we do have is not the usual Android runaround. We have uh, full software from kernel on up. The only thing we don't have is the open source OpenGL stack for the Molly GPU that is on this ARM um, die. So we will be using libhybris to access that because those are written for Android. But the kernel itself will be the Android kernel, but adapted uh, for a MER uh, runtime, our usual trick in, with MER and Plasma Active. Um, and then you get the uh, MER runtime on top of that. And every single driver, every bit of code that runs the CPU, uh, everything in the kernel is free software, G, uh, GPL. We're checking for compliance uh, prior to release. And on day zero of release, we also give all the source code. I'm really excited about that. So this, and this is where another kind of interesting detail becomes um, visible. So this is our big PCP board. Now, when I went through the list of things that are on that little board, I didn't mention a few things. Um, yeah, in fact, there's quite a few things I didn't mention. Um, you might be going, well, if I have a Wi-Fi chip or if I have a GPS chip or if I have a, where does all that go? It goes on this PCB. Um, putting everything on the uh, one uh, small card not only would over-specify that bit of hardware, we want to be able to use those small PCMCIA factor cards for multiple different kinds of devices and not only tablets. Um, and secondly, it means that you're committing to, th to components that are not going to be appropriate in every device. Do I want 3G? Maybe not. Do I you know, want Wi-Fi? Maybe not. Maybe. Depends on the device. Um, am I going to have a, a G sensor? Definitely. Definitely if it's a tablet like this. Not so much if it's a, a media box that sits in your house. So what you do is you take that EOMA 68 card and you devise a PCB layout like this that connects it to everything else. So in our case, we have a touchscreen, which means we have a touchscreen IC, which is not on the EOMA 68 board. Uh, the chip actually sits on a little bit of on the connector that connects the uh, touchscreen to the uh, 
uh, to the, the the main PCB board. So we need to be able to get information, um, you know, event, touch events and all of this from the touchscreen module to the, well, into the kernel eventually, right? So that we can actually respond to your touches in Plasma Active. And that's what this port does. So you'll see that there's this huge blank spot that's mysteriously shaped like a, P a PCMCIA card. Um, and that's because that's where it goes. So there's the spot for the PCMCIA header right here, and that's where they will meet, uh, mate up. You can see that there's a couple of little uh, holes here or, or spots that are marked out um, where mounting will happen, um, as well as in the back here where you can actually screw things in, both to the case, but also in this case to the UMA68 uh, uh, mechanism or the PCMCIA mechanism. Now, if you're going, hey, wait a minute, does that mean that I could take, you know, this tablet with this touch screen and put in a new CPU if I really carefully removed all the parts? Or if I get a new chassis, could I take my old um, PCMCIA 68 or uh, PCMCIA card, the OMA 68 uh, 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 system on chip board and slide it into the new device? And the answer is yes. Um, that's one of the really, really cool things about this is it actually starts moving us towards um, upgradable mobile systems. Um, it, something of a first, I think. I haven't really seen this uh, much elsewhere. But it also allows us to repurpose a lot of these things um, for different kind, radically different kinds of devices, not just tablets. Um, so we don't have to redo all the hardware engineering every single time. It also means we can keep the tablet form factor and we do uh, dual core, which we're already actually working on. We have, we have um, another EOMA68 board with dual core. We're looking at a quad core device as well for next year, um, at the earliest, I think, uh, probably next year anyways. Um, we will be able to keep this engineering, if we wish anyways, um, and simply replace the system on chip uh, PCMCIA bit. And this also allows us to do things like provide an EOMA68 that is suitable for, say, the Free Software Foundation, who wants everything completely free, willing to, you know, take some, some cutbacks on the uh, performance that most consumers are not willing to do. And so we can slot in something not so uh, amazing in terms of, of performance and speed. Um, so there's a very small, very inexpensive chip that sits on here that uh, a little microcontroller that's basically another tiny little, almost does nothing, um, you know, CPU. And we load a small bit of code onto it and it um, communicates between the EOMA68 and all the components on this board. So it, take, it, it handles basically forwarding on, you know, the touch events, um, transmitting data between the... Uh, Wi-Fi, IC, and the network layer uh, on the OMA68 card, etc. Um, and here actually is what the inside of the part of the PCMCA card that faces outside. And be really careful I said that because it's confusing. And um, so you don't actually see, you know, this kind of teeny bit on from the outside of the case. But this does a few things. One, it keeps it isolated. It keeps it rigid. Um, and it also, on the other side, which is where the PSCMCIA header goes, it allows us to uh, mount it um, and also pop them in and out, uh, the actual EOMA68 cards. So it's a really, really interesting, neat little design. Um, yeah. And we finally have silicon that is rolling off of, off of uh, factory lines. Um, uh, something that is almost, uh, given the amount of effort and time we've put into these things, almost too good to believe for me anyways. And yeah, this colorful, these colorful schematics are wonderful. We have another one for the, uh, the PCB um, main board that this mates onto. So... That's kind of an um, additional little peek, sneak peek into what we've got going with Vivaldi, which will become the Vivaldi um, tablet, what you're seeing there. Uh, right now, we've got final case work. Now that we have the PCB boards actually physically um, falling off the line uh, at the factory, now they can do final, you know, making sure that all the mechanical design really works in practice as opposed to in theory um, and do any final bits and novels that need to be changed, if anything.
So, yes, dangerously, wickedly close uh, to having a complete product. Um, and in tandem with that, we've been doing all kinds of uh, things to prepare. Um, I'll give you a really, really quick sneak peek, although I'm not going to go through very much what's on it. We have a new website that's coming. Um, this is actually online, uh, but not on the main Make Play Live um, right now. Uh, we're still filling in, backfilling in some of the content, um, but we've been working on this in tandem with a number of our partners from the partner network, retail, and and elsewhere. Um, and so we'll have a one-stop shop for you know finding out about Vivaldi tablets, how to get one, how they're put together, um, apps and content, how to participate with the uh, content store. We've actually been working on. Uh, uh, the production version of Bodega, uh, which is up and running actually. We just put in the high availability front end um, in front of the server today actually. Uh, and our partner network for people who want to get um, involved and it's got forums and you can put, you can create an account here and communicate with people and set up groups and share documents. And so we really want to get people who are interested in open hardware, um, open devices, free culture around the Make Play Live concepts that we and others, not only us, are working on, um, give everyone kind of a home. Um, we're not going to be taking away from the uh, main, the upstream uh, free software projects. I mean, I am in an upstream free software project to this as well. Um, we'll be pushing everybody uh, towards, you know, Plasma Active and Mer and Mallet and all the other bits and pieces that we use. You know, if you really want to get down and dirty, you know, start contributing to LibHybris and these kinds of things. Um, but we felt that there was a need as well to have, obviously, some support for the product and everything that goes around it. And I think when we you know, launch the website for Reels, uh, you'll see that it really focuses on community and communication rather than a gigantic sales pitch. Because um, that's not really what we're about. So there we go. Those are my three topics. Um, and I'm just going to quickly, after all that rambling and bubbling, because we're going to, um, we're going to go into the QA section. Now, in fact, I will take off the Vivaldi bit now in the Hangout toolbox and replace it with Q&A. I like to think I didn't make any typos this week as opposed to the last episode. Who knows? We'll see. Okay. So um, we've got a nice number of people in the IRC channel. That's great to see. Um, And no particular questions here. That's good. If you have questions, drop them in the IRC channel. Please feel free. I do watch and look. Um, in the chat, a few people. Um, so Manuel Tortosa asked that he wonders if we cannot lose speed by using QML for so many things. And that's a really, really, really good question. Um, so this is very much kind of a replay of, you know, should I use, you know, back in the day, should I use Java or should I use C? Should I use, you know, if I do my UI in Python or Ruby, will I, you know? The reality is that the vast majority of the code actually is run in um, C++. So it's natively compiled. The, so there's not a huge amount of if, very, very little actually overhead. And when you look at the performance um, of it, you don't really notice a difference. Now, where you can get bogged down is if you do huge amounts of application logic in JavaScript. And as Marco Martin brought out uh, in response to this, actually, in the, in the chat, um, he said, you know, the key is no JavaScript and hot paths. And that's completely true. Um, JavaScript is quite fast these days, but it does have its limits. Um, and when you put it next to, you know, tightly written C++, it's just not going to compete well in all cases. Um, what's really important, though, is the way QML is designed so that it's declarative. It allows the creation of a state machine, a graph, if you will. And that graph, not if you will, it is a graph. And that graph can then be used to create a scene in, in OpenGL 
that can do minimal rendering. Um, and it can also, it can orchestrate all different pieces. So in the imperative model, which is what we're using right now when we use uh, a Q graphics view, for instance, uh, there's no way to know whether or not if you have a push button, for instance, when that push button is going to paint, the push button decides. It goes, I am now going to paint. So schedule me a paint loop, please. Um, and it then paints. And what is it going to paint? Psh, who knows? The, the plug, the, uh, the push button knows. Nobody else does. And so it becomes almost impossible, well, becomes quite impossible for a top-down uh, approach to like an overview approach to the, the drawing and painting. And this makes it really difficult to optimize it beyond a certain point. So with QML, we have this state machine style. And behind that, we get this scene graph, a true proper scene graph, the same kind of thing that they use in, in most video games that do you know high performance graphics. Um, and it allows all the separate little pieces to animate together, to move in fluid, fluidity and for only what needs to be drawn to be drawn exactly when it's drawn and to time it all together. So you don't have you know, things you know, moving and, and resizing and then going, oh, okay, now we have to repaint this little bit and that'll get repainted later. Um, and it creates these beautifully fluid UIs as a result. And because this can all be done in, in coordination and in tandem and minimally, it can be done in the place it should be, which is the graphics hardware. Um, we can, if you have even a moderately okay OpenGL system, um, I mean, look at what they can, what you can do on Raspberry Pi. It's not a rocket science GPU they have on there, and it can push things around remarkably well. So uh, I was watching a video the other day, actually, a presentation on QML, and there was some neat little math that showed that you can do uh, shader, uh, around 200 lines of shader application. Um, on the Raspberry Pi and get full uh, 60 frames per second. So, and that's not an extraordinarily powerful device to say the least. So it's 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 quite good. Um, which means that if we use it for what it's designed for, which is graphics um, and the, and the user interface, and we keep as much of the of the business logic, at least the uh, performance sensitive logic, um, outside of the JavaScript runtime, we should do quite well. I hope that uh, answers that for, for Manuel. Manuel says, dope. I, I will take that as a yes. Uh, there was a couple other questions um, left in my blog. One was by Jiro, J I'm not gonna pronounce that last name correctly. It has far too many consonants in a row from my mouth. Um, I'll just call him Jiro, which is also probably mispronounced. Uh, but he says, or asked, I would like to know if the performance of Plasma Active for WeTab has improved in the upcoming version, which is Plasma Active 4. Um, I can definitely say yes. So we noticed that there was a lot of lags and stops and humps and bumps. One of the biggest ones would have been when you um, go to add something to your activity, you pull it up, you start typing something in the uh, search, and it would just clock up for a bit. Or when you first popped it up, it would take a, you know, a second or a second and a half to think about what it was going to show. Um, these things are quite a bit faster. Um, we also found some new optimizations in Nipomoc that we can provide uh, apply that aren't going to be in PA4, so PA5 is going to be even faster than that. Um, I find the PA4 experience, even on the Wii tab, uh, which is now several years old in terms of hardware capabilities, to be far smoother than what we had on, uh, on Plasma Active 3. And I was already satisfied with PA3. Um, so we still, of course, have work to do. I'm not going to lie to you and say nothing left to do. Um, there is still a fair amount to do. Like I said, we've already found some new uh, methods of querying Nihumak that I think are going to be fairly uh, impressive. One query drops from one and a half seconds to approximately 40 to 50 milliseconds. Um, and that's in the Files app. And that will be hitting sometime PA post Plasma Active 4. I would could very well see it being backported, though, um, to a uh, patch um, update to PA4. It's not a query that you hit every single time constantly, though, so you don't notice it, um, except for on first startup. There's a, but a second where it takes time to uh, uh, populate the uh, kinds of files you have on the sidebar, if you have a lot of files. If you have just a few files, it's really quick. Um, but we found a really fast way of doing that. 
So the last major, major blocker was pretty much resolved um, thanks to Marco's work the other day. And so we're pretty good at this point for a PA4 release. I'm really excited and looking forward to it because that's going to be what we also base the Vivaldi image off of. So the Vivaldi image will be PA4 plus whatever updates and patches we manage to squeeze in between now and when we have to commit to the final gold um, for the image there. Um, we do have some nice things in PA4 such as the uh, Plasma Media Center and a few other bits. So really looking forward to that. Um, Cecil Lift, uh, which is funny because I now know what a Cecil Lift is. Um, it's that thing that goes up the side of the mountain. Uh, a, what do we call it? A um, gondola kind of thing. I don't know if that's exactly a perfect translation. Anyways, Cecil Lift, um, who's actually Thomas Pfeiffer, um, asked uh, what were my opinions on Bitcoin, especially since it's been going up and down radically in, in valuation. Uh, it's interesting. I, I read an article by Bruce Schneier, and I have huge respect for that guy. Brilliant guy says it as it is, knows his stuff. And when asked about it, and it was on CNN even, I think it was, where I saw this, he said, well, technically I've looked at it. The cartography is good. It's technically well done, but I don't know enough about economics and that kind of thing to offer an opinion on, on that side of it. So I won't. And he just kind of said, no, I, I'll just talk about the technical side. That's what I'm good at. I have huge respect for that because part of of one of the tricks of not looking like an idiot is to know when to shut your mouth. Um, and usually that comes around the time when your expertise and what you're educated in stops. Um, after that, you just end up guessing. And that rarely turns out well, especially in complex topics like the valuation of an, an economic model like Bitcoin. So I'm going to plead the Bruce Schneier fifth and say, I really don't know enough about it. Um, to, to comment on it. I think it's remarkably interesting. Um, I've been interested in alternative currencies for a number of years. Uh, my Actually, the first time I spoke in Switzerland, um, one of the fellows who spoke before me or after me, I think it was after me later in the day, uh, spoke on alternative currencies. He was a professor at UC Berkeley, economist there. Um, super interesting stuff, but I don't think I could offer anything overly useful other than I hope it doesn't end up in a crater because a lot of people I know are interested in it. Um, uh, oh, Jero's there in the IRC channel. Awesome. Hello. He says, I am not, Aaron, you're not the only one with problems pronouncing my name, but at least I managed to pronounce the first name correct enough. Hurrah for that. Um, yeah, and, and Jero, if, if you can um, like do a a you know, pronouncing your name for dummies version, uh, you know, phonetic version of it, I, I will be happy to try. Um, I just have a name that people slaughter all the time as well, and so I try not to do that to other people's names. And that brings us pretty much right to the end of our episode. It's been nearly an hour. I hope you found it as enjoyable as I did, and I will see all of you, and perhaps even more, next week. I'll be moving a back to Thursday, the usual day, and it will be back at 20, uh, actually, no, it'll be moving back to 1900 UTC as opposed to 20, so 7 at night instead of 8 at night UTC, because I'd rather do it at 9 p.m. than 10. Um, but that's all for me for this week. Thanks for tuning in. Remember to uh, share your questions, your ideas for topics that I can cover in future shows, uh, either in my, on my blog or on my YouTube account or harass me on IRC or wherever you can find me. So cheers, have a great night, and see you next week.